President, um, Malawian President and Lazarus Chakwera, who shall be joining the Kenyans as they celebrate Mashujade. Preparations have been um, done, of course, that has been uh, piped by the media. And now the focus, we, as you can see on our dailies, is the possible politics that may um, play out as Kenyans celebrate this day. Now, on the front page of the Daily Nation this morning, we're told a test for Uhuru Ruto on last Mashuja day. Now, this is, of course, a divided leadership, as the paper says, as bitter rivals in Kirinyaga overlook their differences to make the event a success. Um, attention will be on the president and his deputy, who are set to share the podium. The front page of the Standard this morning tells us it will be the first time the president, his deputy, ODM leaders, um, meet on the same podium in the backyard, in the president's backyard, just days after the deputy president accused the two of betraying him, even though he helped them ascend to political glory. Now, that is, it's, it, it's difficult to ignore those political undertones. And I'd like um, Honorable Sakwa Bunyasi, who's the member of parliament for Nambale constituency, to tell us what he expects to come out of that. I'm sure experts in body language shall be looking out for any little message passed on from the bodies of these principles but at the same time what they say what will that reflect what do you expect and as far as this is concerned uh takes, what i expect would be uh, extreme extreme cordiality they are going to try and be very nice uh, about what they're saying uh, and so on they are going to deploy to sort of be statesmanly i think that's what i suspect and that uh, there may be some bubs but they'll be very subtle uh, they like to be extremely subtle, uh, not just because they have a guest there, but um, because none of them wants to come off badly on Mashuja Day. So I think today is going to be politeness, relative politeness, uh, maybe historical recollection, selective historical recollections that might indicate uh, somebody's leaning one way or another, but I don't think there will be any contemporary attacks like, you know, you are, you are doing this to something like we were on this path, you know, and we got uh, sidetracked. Uh, then you have to guess who sidetracked it, but I don't think there are going to be any direct hits at each other. Uh, I think it's going to be more in the, maybe uh, in the eyes of, uh, I think the press may be the one that was expecting to get a cockfight there, but I don't think anything is going to be like, anything like that will happen. Okay, because it wouldn't be the right time or place. It's not a political rally. Uh, Dr. Exen Iraqi, do you agree? When I was a, a young boy, mm. there's one thing I knew. But when guests were around, we had to behave. So because we have a guest from Malawi, then our politicians might not behave the way we expect. So I expect a lot of, a lot of cordiality. I expect that to be very statemanship. So I don't expect a lot of political attacks as we expect. And number two, we expect a lot of focus on 2022. I don't think any of the politicians want to say something that is going to annoy his voters or her voters. So I don't expect a lot of drama, but I expect some jibes, probably some uh, riders, some proverbs, but I don't think there will be any direct attack on each other. But let's also ask ourselves another more basic question. Why this celebration is being held in uh, Kirinyaga? Why Kirinyaga of all places? Yes. I think there's some cyborgism in uh, Kirinyaga as the host for this year's Mashuja Day. Remember, it is in Abadeas, it is in Mount Kenya where freedom fighters fought. And it is the Mount Kenya region where everybody believes you'll get the votes to win the 2022 polls. So I also expect out of cyborgism in terms of the speeches that are going to be given. But let's wait. Let's wait. That's, 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 that's uh, all we can do anyway. But then I like Honorable Bunyasi tells um, what you feel about that, what uh, Dr. Exen Iraqi has pointed out, the symbolism of this being the venue and it's in the background of the Mount Kenya region. And of course, this is a key player as vote, uh, as those candidates, possible candidates try to get as many votes as they can. And one of the issues, uh, when you look at the front page of the standard, another handshake is what they're telling us as ODM leader Raila Odinga joins a handshake between agricultural CS Peter Munya and Meru Governor Kiraitu Murungi at a meeting in Tarakanithi County yesterday. It's quite symbolic and of course some of the issues that this part of the nation wants to hear is what will the whoever takes office in 2022 do for them, particularly in line with agriculture and the many other interests that are at hand. Um, first of all, uh, I think the Krenyaga location venue 
I was selected, I think, maybe last year, at the, uh, most likely. And I don't know if it's a coincidence that events have brought the area to a head, and now uh, the Mashijad Day is there, or it was something that was uh, foreseen, and so on. But whatever the case is, I think it's symbolically very important. It will uh, turn attention to uh, what's going on in the mountain, uh, particularly on its slopes. And uh, I think what's going on is mostly uh, 2022 elections and so on. Uh, that uh, I think the, the, the at least the media in the media is is, is being played out as for to the significance of the mountain in a year when they don't have, according to themselves, uh, a serious presidential candidate. Uh, I think generally it would have been subsumed in uh, in campaigns uh, for candidates that come from for a candidate coming from Mount Kenya. But this time they do not have one, uh, but it's still at the center. It's still going to be a, a major determinant, uh, depending on their voting pattern. And initially, uh, I think people had thought it would vote uh, wholly on one side or another. And I personally think that's not going to happen, but it's going to be significant shares going to uh, whoever they give the, these votes to. And that uh, probably could uh, tip the scale. So that still remains important. But um, I'd also like to add uh, uh, the issues of the economy, particularly agriculture. We've talked about uh, uh, Mira, uh, coffee will probably feature, tea will feature, uh, horticulture will feature. So I think it's a very welcome fact that uh, agriculture, for once, now you know, we get it uh, at the center uh, of, of, of such a, a, a national discussion. In the 70s, agriculture was left, right, and center of Kenya's uh, efforts. And at the time, um, you know, uh, the traditional thinking, say, among economists was that if agriculture does well and you get higher productivity, it releases labor, that would have got some basic education uh, which can enter the market. The good things we used to hear in the old days about the stages of uh, development. Then we got somewhere in the middle and we lost it. I think it's very good that uh, in one way or another, agriculture again uh, is, you know, showing up uh, uh, in our national discussion, and maybe that's the way to go. There's a lot we can gain by focusing on agriculture, by refocusing on agriculture, uh, without compromising well, what we're going to do in technology and others. In fact, this will become uh, facilitators in what we're going to be doing, and it will, it will employ a lot more people than the uh, exhortations we have had about industrialization without backing up uh, that industrialization with the, the preliminaries that need to be put in place. Okay. Now, uh, Dr. Exen Iraqi, while dra political drama might get boring and even predictable sometimes, particularly in Kenya, because there's always something happening, but m I perk up when I hear uh, politics that is based on real issues that people care about. So, for example, when Raila Odinga goes on his tour and he says to the Mira farmers that he's going to actually revive the markets and find even new markets from, from places such as um, uh, Congo, that is pretty positive. What do you make of the role of agriculture and how do you expect it to feature in this year's Mashuja days? Because these are things that the people of central Kenya actually care about and it might actually influence the direction that the upcoming vote will go. For the first time in Kenyan politics, I'm, I'm a very happy man because politicians nowadays, whether you look at uh, Honor Braira, Karonzo, Mudavadi, the president himself, for the first time in Kenyan history, we are talking about economics. When you look at Deputy President, he's also talking about economics. So it's very good news and shows to some extent that Kenya is now becoming a mature nation. We just, we just don't focus on periphery issues. So I feel very happy when I see our readers talking economics, talking about how they can look for, uh, get markets for our, even of all products, Mira. So it's very good news. But remember that politicians have one very famous characteristic. They tell you what you want to hear. So between now and 2022, you hear politicians making promises. But I want them to be more exact. So if you say you are going to help the coffee industry, tell us exactly what you are going to do. If you tell us you are going to help tea industry or Mira industry, be very specific. For example, when you say you are going to get new markets for Milan, why are you choosing DRC or, or, or another place like Somari? Why not any other country? When you say that you are going to get market for a coffee, are you going to tell us how the dominant players in the coffee industry in the world are going to react to that? So I want very specific 
concrete steps on how you're going to help the farmers. Remember that uh, agriculture cons constitutes about 24% 24, 24 of Kenya's GDP. So whether you want or not is an area you cannot ignore. But let's not talk about agriculture because 2022 is coming. Let's talk about agriculture because it's a very important component of our economy. And if we want to improve the status of this economy, even before we go to manufacturing, we must focus, focus on agriculture. Very, very many people work there. And whether we want or not, we eat every day. And a country that cannot feed itself should never talk of, of mashuja, should never talk of national pride. So it's an area we need to focus on, not just in politics, but in reality. And deliver if, if whoever takes office should actually deliver on that front. Now, still on another, speaking of the upcoming elections, another component is the youth factor and the importance of uh, their import, the importance of taking care of their need. They are unlikely heroes as they go through these rough economic times, and some of them are going out of the way to actually help their communities. So they are to be celebrated. But at the same time, there are a lot of promises that are being targeted towards the youth from the deputy president to um, Sadia Mudavadi, you have Raila Odinga with his um, promises. Now we're having on the front page of the Daily Nation um, a snippet of what he, uh, NC party leader Sadia Mudavadi says, and he is calling for incentives instead of promises to the youth. Um, Honorable Sakwa, could you demystify what the difference is right there? Incentives and some of the things that are being said, um, monies that will be given to them or other monies for small business owners, What's, what's the difference? What's, what is Musalim Davadi speaking about here? I think incentives uh, is a way in which you target uh, sectors of the economy or, 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 the, or even the, the, demog the demographic, demographic groups uh, by uh, availing to them facilities that would enable them to use their innate capacity, innovation, and so on. Uh, saying that they are able to contribute a lot more, uh, simply uh, give them an, uh, uh, a conducive environment, an enabling environment. Uh, this, frequently we talk about uh, uh, loans, soft loans, uh, but they also recently some people are talking about a tax-free, uh, that's what BBI is proposing, a tax-free uh, holiday and so on. I do not know if tax-free anything really helps the, uh, the youth who have barely entered uh, the active productive market, even though they have a lot of potential. But incentives could take them, um, give them, say, uh, uh, training, uh, retooling, giving them uh, skills, uh, helping them to access markets actively, uh, of course, providing uh, financial incentives as well. Uh, uh, providing infrastructure facilities that they can easily access. I think there are many things that can be done. Uh, the, I think the, the biggest problem we have in this country, the, uh, given the high unemployment of the youth, is that you, you really get, you really hear of innovations by youth that have been moved into the mainstream. Uh, if we could get that capacity to scale up and move their incentives, their innovations into the mainstream, we may get a lot of them uh, actually gainfully employed, employed and employing others um, and earning royalties that can enable them to invest even more and so on. I think it, it has to be a complete rethink. Uh, I do not think that uh, a solution uh, lies in uh, uh, promising to uh, uh, extricate them from poverty through government transfers. You know, when you give uh, 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 facilities, like for example, we do to the elderly, it's only 2,000, it's not big, it's, it's important. But when you promise significant uh, payments uh, to sectors of your, of your population, it means somebody must earn the money, and that's a, redist a redistribution of that money. That by itself has only a very indirect impact on growing the economy. Somebody must grow it, you take away that bit, you, you distribute to others, you would hope that as you distribute, they can use it in areas that will probably uh, generate some new growth that you don't others have had. So I think it's much better that um, uh, uh, we let the people earn their way through life and facilitate and pave the way for them uh, than probably uh, make uh, uh, transfer payments. The elderly, I think that's a different 
uh, story altogether. Maybe they, because they are now in their, they have contributed the, in, in their lives, but at the end you are trying to reward them as it were. But it also has uh, certain benefits which, which we can get to if there is more time to discuss. Mm -hmm. Dr. Iraqi, do you agree that incentives are the way to go as opposed to cash handouts or fundings for businesses for the young people? That is economics 101. Mm -hmm. Incentives always work better than handouts. And uh, before I respond to that comprehensively, I want to talk of two famous youth that I know of, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg. I'm mentioning them because every Kenyan youth knows about them. Zuckerberg was 23 years old when he started uh, Facebook. Bill Gates was 19 years. Clearly, the youth have a lot of potential. But what is lacking is giving them incentives to start businesses, to expand businesses. And if you gave me hard doubts, why would I work? If somebody has employed me for 4,000 shillings a month, and I'm given hard doubt of 6,000, why should I work? So what we are lacking in this country, and my colleague has put it very clearly, are incentives. If I started a small business today transporting or using border border, what incentives am I given? Could it be, for example, contracts? Could it be something like better fuel prices? Could it be something like tax rebates if I buy two or three motorcycles? If I'm a farmer today and I'm a youth and I decide to become a farmer, what incentives would I get to bring cabbages from Kinagop to, to a place like Nairobi? If I'm working in Kirinyaga and I'm growing rice, what incentives do I get to bring that rice from that place to Nairobi or where the market is? So whatever we do as economists or as economic players, we, we, we do that because of incentives. The incentives could be something as simple as profits. So if, for example, I find I'm going to make more profits in a certain industry, I'll move there. If I find that the government is giving me better tax because I'm in a certain industry, I'll move there. If I go to an industry and I find that I'm getting some subsidies as incentives, I'll move there. So what the youth in this country are missing is not the energy. They have enough energy. And the youth from other countries, have, as I've given examples, have led, led the way. They have shown examples, or they have led by examples. So what we should be hearing from the, our leaders, the political leaders who want to be leaders in 2022, are these are the incentives for the youth, not hard doubts. One of them is the working environment. I'm always fascinated when I drive around Nairobi, and I find mechanics working on the side of the road. Like a few years ago, there used to be some mechanics on the road between uh, the Grove Roundabout and Museum Hill. They used to work there, and you find them every day. Then some, when the road was constructed, they moved from there. So where are, these, where are those youths now? Why didn't somebody look for a place for them to do their business? Because they are earning an honest living. So give people incentives, you'll be surprised. Okay, that is true, that is true. Hopefully that is the direction that the country takes as we try to figure out these tough economic times. But far from that, the fact that uh, we are having the Malawian president attending, of course, is um, elevates this issue to just not a local event, but also an event that uh, is of significance, particularly when it comes to the sovereignty of Kenya. Now, when you look at um, some of the issues of sovereignty that have been affecting us, or rather that have been at the forefront of the uh, in terms of press coverage and of course in terms of what Kenya is dealing with one of them is the Somalia Kenya boundary row it hasn't gone away magically it's still with us now I'd like Honor Honorable Sakwa to tell us what do you feel is going to come out from the president is he going to um, do something to try and uh, pass a message a significant message to the entire world about Kenyan sovereignty when it comes to the Kenya Somalia boundary row is this going to be an issue that will feature prominently in if you could predict? Um, I think the, he's likely approach. First of all, I believe that, um, I, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm subject to correction. It was a mistake for Kenya to completely abandon a defense uh, at the ICJ, the court, International Court of Justice, on the Somali question. They had historical reason. They didn't recognize the, the court itself, so they refused to go. But uh, surprisingly, uh, the, uh, the court uh, made a judgment, and others might want to use it to uh, uh, implement the decision. What I expect he'll do, um, he'll say Kenya is a peace-loving nation with all its neighbors, and we're looking forward to uh, greater co collaboration and cooperation, but that they would not be pushed around, uh, that they'll defend what they have fully as they seek friendship. Uh, I think it's going to be a, 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 a two-sided message. You know, you have, this time the stick will be burning from both ends. 
uh, you know, you sort of, uh, I, I, I think he will appear tough, but also appear willing to accommodate uh, dialogue and discussion. Uh, so I think he will, um, uh, and you know, remember, we, we have lots of our, our, our troops inside Somalia, uh, so he's going to have to be quite firm but diplomatic in the way he does it. I don't think that uh, he will come out angry and so on because uh, we don't have um, uh, all of the choices. We are caught in in some way. And uh, we have some de facto situation that has been uh, uh, set up because of the ICJ judgment. So I think it's going to uh, appear tough as, as well as accommodating. That's my view. I think it will be a kind of mixed message. We'll have to uh, strike a balancing act in one way or the other. Dr. Iraqi? Yeah, it's, it's a very dicey situation because when the president uh, speaks about the Kenya-Somari border, he has two constituencies to think about. One of them is the international community. He has to give a speech or make a comment that is not going to rattle the international community or appear to be in dissonance with the international expectations. He also, he also, also has to look at the local community, the voters, the Kenyans. And he must make a speech that will not make Kenya appear as a weakling or a country that is uh, not leading to ex ex its expectations. And maybe to, to support what my colleague is saying, Kenya has uh, troops in Somali for the last 10 years. And that's a significant factor. Probably that might make Kenya feel that they have a leverage, but we do not want to appear like a bully to the international community. And I think it is also important to realize that uh, we have a significant community of Somali in Kenya either as citizens or as refugees, and you also must take cognizance of their presence and their feelings. But this issue of the border is, is becoming significant because if it becomes a precedence, and this is my fear, other countries in our neighborhood might start saying, let's also redefine our borders. Because we, now, we might now start asking, does the, does the right go straight? Does the right go at an angle? How does it go? And uh, to be comical, even my neighbor who, 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 I, who I share a chamber with might start arguing the same way. So I think this issue needs diplomacy, it needs a lot of calmness, and it needs to look at good, both global and 